There goes my great talk <laughs> with Clemens Berger. And uh, this builds on, on uh, the final categories, which were uh, joined with Ben Ward. So, as I joked before, so I'll start with the theorem. So, what's the theorem? And then I'll explain uh, some of these things, but I can't explain everything because I'm giving a blackboard talk. So the theorem is the following thing. So uh, let F be a keyword defining category. So FC stands for finding category with a keyword called factorization system. Right. Then the inclusion, I can just take the subcategory of right morphisms that includes into the full sign full, full category induces um, morphism of cubical complexes. Which identifies uh, so cubical complexes and they get a name. So it's called this inclusion I uh, W I push for W of trivial. So these are just names. So for all. Object star of F. Uh, star of F, for which identifies WC star with sign. Of the link of zero of stuff. So that's the theorem. It has all the words in the title. Uh, a cubic confinement category, the only thing that's not in the title is this factorization system. And then I'll be concerned with the thing which we know and love. Uh, so I have trees sitting inside connected graphs, and this corresponds to a factorization system on on the sign category G. And then if you apply it, so I learned how to say this thing so if you do this you get r space and uh, as, a, as a spine complex and uh, um, and you get uh, i was told to now i was told i'm 80s if i call this a metric uh, graph complex so i'm supposed to call this a tropical curve complex and then there is a little remark so finally destroy the charts <clears throat> So that's not can handle that. So then uh, maybe your mark here is so this is well with a big element construction called decoration. And then the application is.
is to, so here in this case, so we have sort of um, something like ribbon graphs, uh, application, I write something about small graph spaces. So then the smaller complex is, so we have actually the smaller complex is the compactification, the penner conceivage, so yes, the bigger complex, the penner conceivage compactification and uh, the sort of maybe the spine of MGN sitting in there. So I'll explain those two things. Then I have a couple of more remarks. So then, so what does this have to do with graph complexes? Another remark. So how do graph complexes fit in here? So I, I refer you to the Simon category book paragraph. This is not the way to do it, but I'll do it. Uh, six nine. So this says that we should look at something like this FKD. And uh, we had in Ben's talk that this FK is isomorphic to F3, so this partial rule. So I, I won't be doing this today. So this is this is a what this is, this is the chain version. Of this W construction, which is a set of, which is this cubicle shape, cubicle complex. So, but what but Ben was saying, and these computations go through the fact that if I have a cubicle Feynman category, it's Cauchul that meant that uh, that uh, if I I can take the Cauchul dual, and that was the same as this K twisted, which meant uh, that you uh, switch the determinants. So this is when you make uh, legs. So an application to graphs, uh, 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 this means that the edges will have the green one, right? And we will see here in this cubicle complex that it should be a cubicle complex, so it has cubes. So the cubes will be for given graph, the cubes are it's just the uh, interval to the number of edges. Maybe I should say this here somewhere. So the cube here, I have a cube of gamma, which is just i to the uh, number of edges. That's the cubic complex. And then you see, actually, topologically, this is one dimensional. So if I start fooling around with these things, that has an SN action, which uh, changes the orientation of this, which is the same thing as saying that the edges have uh, weight one. All right, but this is about the topological stuff. So here's the example, a little more detail. So details, I won't fit. So maybe I'll put it here. No, I can't put it there. So then where do I put this? Problem as well. So let me raise this. So let me raise this. Let's see how this works. So um, I have problems with the chart. Now I have a cyclic. This is basically trees. I can explain that uh, maybe a little later. So then I have all graphs. I call that F connected or F, um, F graph that we're connected. And I have this inclusion. And now there's actually something interesting going on for the first thing. So this is, and I forgot the archive number. This is already in a paper with Clemens Berger. But this is type, this type of situation. So then we have a general theorem saying that actually what's sitting up here is this F modular. So there's a nice theorem that if I take I push forward of the trivial, this is the genus markings. F decorated by the genus marking is F modular. So let me explain that a bit. So what does this mean? The whole point is that if I look at functors on F cyclic to C, which are strict monoidal, so Feynman categories have this 
one is a problem for the monoidal or symmetric monoidal category. So if I look at strong symmetric monoidal functors, these are uh, these are exactly the cyclic operands in C. And then you can ask, well, what, about, what is this F connected? F connected C. Uh, we call them in a paper with uh, N Ward and Javier Zuni is a Niga connect non genus marked modular operands. And of course, as you would expect, F mod functors out of F mod, which is C, these are modular operands. That tells me that I have to tell you what this T is. So since I'm talking about functors, I can always define a trivial functor. So C is also a monoidal category that has a unit. The trivial functor is just assigns to any x monoidal unit and to any unit. So this is, I'll call that the trivial functor. So that's a functor. This is inclusion of categories. This thing here, that's just the left count extension. Along F in the theorem is this is monoidal. So, what that says, if I have a functor out of here, I can push it forward along here. Backwards is just restriction, right? If I have some category and I have a functor here, I could just go back by taking this and then that. If I want to push it forward, I have to do something, and it's a cut essentially. And this will be important in it. So, so this is nice. So I always have one functor, namely the trivial functor. Nobody can read this. This is strong in the world. But quite in general, that works. So now, if I push this forward, then what I'm saying is I get another functor, and that's the functor that was just described um, by Francis, namely the one where you contract an edge. And so, what is it? It marks vertices by a natural number. If you contract an edge, you add the numbers. If you contract the loop, it goes by, by plus one. The fun thing here is this is now a computation, not a definition. It's the push forward, it's the con extension. So that is completely natural. And it's the one that you get for free. All right, so then what can I do? I can look at this uh, the situation and we actually, uh, there's a, maybe an aside here. This is also a unique factorization. So that this thing here is a covering map or a decoration. So this is an element category over this. And then uh, with Clemens Berger, uh, we proved that this is um, indeed a factorization into something which is called a connected map and a covering. So this whole diagram constructs itself just from having trees into connected graphs. And now uh, I, can, I can look at these complexes. So what do I get? So let's see, I need all these things. So let me say a little bit about the W construction. This goes back to Boardman and Vogt. And uh, this is in this uh, paper for cubic refinement categories and refinement category thing. But what's the basic idea? The idea is the following. First of all, you need that uh, there is a degree of morphisms. And this should be bigger equal to zero. Then uh, this degree is zero if you only if uh, sigma is an iso. And then uh, we want things to be generated by degree zero, generated by, sorry, by degree zero and one. 
And then we want to consider everything. And here I'll be awake up to. So what does it mean? It means that uh, if I have a morphism, x, uh, any morphism I can write down as x, let's see, I can never do this. x and phi, let me start with x0, phi1, x1, phi2, x2, and so on to phi and xn. So if I have morphism phi, phi has degree n, then I can decompose it into a sequence of morphisms of degree one. Bear with me for a sec, I'll get back to graphs in one minute or less. And now the idea is to each phi, I want to associate this cube i phi, which is i to the degree of phi. And I already had this up on the board before. It's like for the for the graph, the, each of these elementary morphisms will be something like an edge contraction. So it's indexed by an edge. And uh, you'll get a cube to the number of x. And the idea is that you just associate times t1, t2. Maybe I should take a different color. So how do I get the cube? So if I have a <clears throat> chain, it's basically something in the nerve, but only with degree one thing. So t1, t2, up to tn, those are the parameters of my cube. And now you immediately notice something, and somebody should complain and say, well, you ordered the parameters, but nobody said how to order these things. So I could have different decompositions and so on and so on. So I should have made this bar here. I should say that they're exactly n factorial decompositions. Of uh, if the degree is n and s n x times the degree. So if that's okay, then I can just take here the class of phi, and then things uh, become nice. I just take a pick a representative. So what does this look like? I prepare the board. So things that are. So um, here's the thing that you might be used to. Uh, namely, I take a graph with two edges. I should have maybe take the one which is a little more not tree-like, but let's take the tree like I can contract first edge one, then I get this thing. Uh, that's not actually edge two, but that's edge two prime because it's the edge in the um, image graph. And then I can contract two, or I can contract two first and then one, and I get the same answer. And this is the diagonal morphism contracts both edges. That's the one of length two. And two factorial is two, so there are exactly two ways of doing this. If I had three edges, I would get a cube. There's a cube here somewhere. So that I would get a cube and then the different ways of contracting that one, two, three, uh, the three factorial ways of contracting that would give me paths on these cubes. I'll get back to that. So this is the Feynman category picture. Uh, I don't have time to get into this course of mine in category of graph stuff, but uh, with usually here, the, the morphisms. So here the objects were indexed by graphs. Here the morphisms are indexed by graphs. There's a slight shift here, but that explains this thing here. So since each morphism is indexed by a graph, so the T1 here, this will go to this T1 here, and then I have a T2 here. So if I look at the diagonal map here, which corresponds to this tree, I'll have a T1 and a T2. And then, okay, so that's the, that's the cubes. And then again, Francis said how to glue cubes together, uh, except that Francis did something a little different than I did, and I have a picture for that. So uh, the question now is, where do you take these things? So I don't have to, so Francis likes to take them as R and bigger equal to zero, half space is mod R and R plus, but let me not do that. So let me truncate this R and bigger zero, uh, which I did with the cubes. So I have that uh, they live in zero or one, and now something magic happens. So what I was about to say now uh, doesn't really uh, doesn't really matter too much for the general story, but it matters very much if you want to interpret things in terms of graphs. So now, what do you do? So in in a graphical complex, maybe I can see this one. Up. So in this cubical complex, I have a cubical differential.
or maybe I should say this before. So to finish that story on a higher level, <clears throat> the point is, what does this W do? Actually, this W, uh, it, it takes a functor from my cubical Feynman category, I mean, right, cubical to C, to topological spaces, and pops out uh, spaces. And this is the co resolution. Maybe there's some conditions that I have to say, but the whole point is that this W construction was made for a purpose to give a cofiber resolution of uh, some topological operat and, uh, or, you know, some topological functor out of the Feynman category, like an operat, modular operat, or what have you, uh, non sigma modular operat, non proper ad, whatever you want. So I should probably, yeah, proper ad is fine. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, and then, um, so this is how this works. So it, this is a functor. And I'll get back to that. So the fact that this is a functor, um, this will, if I get to this, this I think will have something to do with the core interaction. So there's a conjecture. Um, actually, it's false. All right, so the abstract story, but let's go back to concreteness. So if I have a Q that has two sorts of uh, differentials, uh, D0 and D1 for each I, so cubic complexes are a little bit, a little bit difficult because you know if I, if I have a Q, I can go this way, this way, this way, or that way. So I have four of these differentials. That's why I usually let people like syntheses, but this is fine. So what for graphs? So in general, we have that if T goes to zero, Ti goes to zero, you sort of, you compose, and so you contract the edge. So you contract the edge, maybe this is for graphs. But if Ti goes to one, there, there, there are several things you can do. Maybe the first thing is you can, you can actually just mark the edge. You can, Cut the edge, or um, if you like cluster algebras, you can freeze the edge. So this is this is an interpretation, but here you just contract the edge. So in the general story, you cut off something, you put it to the end, and you cut off something. So and then what kind of pictures do you get? So let's let's just do this because we've seen this. So in the last talk, we had. We had this uh, wonderful graph. So this triangle in the middle was the one for the theta graph. And I think I just erased it from the board. So this was the one that, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, um, all right, so this is, this is this. So I got to the triangle, which is first. So this is, and then what, the, what this uh, thing does is you're taking the co-limit over, you're taking the co-limit over cubes where you identify these uh, where ti goes to zero. And usually you don't have that many identification goes to ti goes to one. The ti goes to one is post-composition. I'll get to that difference in the functor. When the ti goes to zero, uh, you contract the edge and then you glue the cube from the next thing onto there. Okay, so that's great. So uh, what happened was what is about what is supposed to happen, namely I took something say combinatorial where my uh, things are so well maybe I should say this. So how does it then work? Um, no, I need this. Don't let me erase this guy. So maybe I should go here, explain something more. So what this looks like. So what is this cubical complex? Or the case of just graphs. Again, this is a computation, not a definition. So the W is just defined for any old cubical Feynman category. And so if I take my W of the trivial functor and evaluate it at some, let's even do a genus mark thing with n leaves. What is it? This is maybe some union over uh, phi mapping from something into this. Again, it's a left hand extension, so it's all these morphisms. So this is um, 
Gn also then uh, and then an i to the degree of phi, and here I just take these isomorphism classes. And uh, this uh, this union it's not disjoint it's a disjoint union modulo equivalence relation uh, where I glue along these sides. So basically, for each graph, this fixes the external structure. So this says that uh, what are the terms? So if one cube or one n cube, one n cube degree phi cube, one cube. Graph with external structure gamma not gamma all the edges of gamma and star gn, where this is computed in the way that Francis said as the genus genera and collapses. And if I didn't take the gn, if I don't take the gn, if I just take w star of n, this is just. The same thing, but then I should take gamma not edges, but gamma um, with an optic crack of genus. So that's that's what that is. So I have one cube for each one of these, and um, the n factorial ways of looking at a graph uh, as a composition are enumeration of the ends. So that's uh, that's nice. So those are the graphs, and then. What I said was uh, what is supposed to happen happens. Of course, this is contractible. So note there is a cone point. There is a cone zero. There is a cone point. So zero vector cone point in each all of phi. Right. I mean, I have the one where I set all the parameters down to zero. That means I collapse all the edges. So it doesn't matter which which graph I'm looking at. I'm just getting back my star. So that's a cone point. So the space is contractible, so I'm not going to get any homological information or anything nice out of it. So what I should do is I should look at the link. Like so, I should look at the link. And this is something nice. The link is a simplex. So this is the one where the sum of the ti is one, right? I mean somehow, and I have pictures here. So if I have a cube, I have my cone point down here. I actually have the rays for the r plus. And then I'll do two things. So what I'm doing now is I'm saying, well, I can. In, I have the link here is the simplex. But now something fun happens. Um, well, anyway, so that gives me a simplicial complex, and that's the one that you always look at for tropical curves or have you, what have you, for ribbon graph complexes and so on. Those are the simplicial complexes you see. Um, the way it's constructed is the endpoints here are in the simplex. So for the modularized space, I'll get there in a sec. I will get the Penner conservative compactification of the modularized space. Now, what I could have done is instead of taking the rays and taking um, the fundamental domain to be the simplex, I could have taken the um, back side of the cube. Right? This is the same, it's a convex body. I can take any convex body, but I'll take the back side of the cube. This is the equivalence of the max norm and the a uh, one norm. I hope I got that right. Then anyway, it's the equivalence of two norms. So I can take the back side of the cube, and then I see I have a flow from the back side of the cube to the simplex, which gives me a cubical decomposition of the simplex. And so let me do this one dimension higher because then you see a little bit more. So here's my cube. Here is the simplex sitting inside the cube. If I take this um, this flow inward, then I see exactly this cubical decomposition of the simplex. And if you remember your your things, so here it's like I could take um, the zero three. So this is for star zero three. Well, or you know whatever. Take this graph. So um, yeah, this is it is no, it's a, yeah. So um, could also be another one. So this is one of the, one of the standard standard. Uh, it is the theta graph, isn't it? Yeah, and I get two barbells, right? This is the theta graph, and these are the these are the standard barbell graphs. So that's the standard thing you would get for a pair of pants. So you get these three triangles, and now what happens upstairs is uh, something which happens here. So now I have to explain the next step. So what I explained is actually that I get a modularized space, a compactified modularized space, which is just the link of this cone. That was part of the theorem. 
And then I claim there's an open part and that sits in there as a spine. So how do I get the open part? So now, yeah, and I'm doing the same thing, Karen, if I'm running around, so he has to follow me with the camera. All right, so what happens here? So if I'm in the cyclic case, that just means I'm allowed to contract subtrees. There I could contract everything, and I did. And here I'm just allowed to contract subtrees. So those things, uh, and then if I push that over here, it's a computation. What happens is that, uh, first of all, it's just a cubical complex. What I would get is this kind of complex because I can contract um, spanning trees, spanning forests, actually. This has three spanning trees, which correspond to those three contractions. This one just has one spanning tree. And there's not much going on with spanning forests because the thing is too small. But what you can see is that I would again get a cubical complex. And the question is, how does this cubical complex sit in, sit in here? And it actually fits inside here as exactly these three, the subcomplex of the back, back phase complex. And that is again not by not by magic. That is by definition. Uh, if you if you compute these things, then what happens is that you can um, post compose uh, the cube complexes, which says that if I have a morphism, maybe I should write this somewhere. If I have a morphism, so now I'm using that W as a functor. So what that says is that if I have a phi zero this uh, phi one, this should act on this complex. So it should act on this Q of some phi, let's see, let's call this phi one and on the cube of some phi zero. And what it does is, it, in, in, so this is a cube, it injects that cube into the cube of I phi one after phi zero, uh, where, you know, the, the T for the, the tj for phi one are equal to one as the back size. That's what it does. It freezes the edges. So the edges that aren't there, it freezes. This is just a general thing. So this is just by functoriality. Uh, the way the functor acts is that it will freeze the edges behind. So that embeds it into the back faces. So that naturally embeds uh, the smaller complex, which I got from this factorization system from trees into the back side. Now I use this flow to the simplex and I see that I get a spine. And then there's something nice uh, because <coughs> if I look at now this complex, I have to make this complex nice. So usually the thing you do is you take a, so if you want to work simplicially, what you do is you take a, the second barycentric subdivision and then everything is simplicial. And then you can work in the simplicial in the simplicial story. So this is a beautiful story about how cubical and simplicial complexes talk to each other. And then I can look at the vertices, and either the vertices are inside the complex, the pink one, or not. And then uh, you see that the flow here is just the fact that I have the blue complex, so the total complex, total simplicial complex is blue and pink. Um, or any complex. So the total complex is the join between the blue complex. And this is true like in all situations, but, uh, and the pink, uh, the pink complex. And then, uh, so it's called CP and C blue, or actually I should call this, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. So this actually, in, in reality, this is C left, so, but I don't know which one. This is C left and this is C right. So the right complex is the nice complex and the left complex is sort of the forbidden complex, any where you contract loops that change the topology. And so that uh, proves the theorem. So in general, this is all true. It's just exactly like I said. And then uh, the fact that you know the this minus the boundary retracts to the spine on the open moduli space. I can define what the open closed ones are exactly by this procedure. Is just the fact that this is a joint, so I can just flow. It actually gives me two flows. It gives me a flow from the thing minus the boundary to the spine. It also gives me a flow from the thing minus the spine to the boundary. Right? I can flow. Flow lines are just given. Actually, the flow lines, this would be a G, all the flow lines are 
So the, these are these are also the flow lines that show me this way. Okay. All right. So I had a pretty picture, but that's on the slides. And if you want to see the pretty picture, I think the talk uh, at the conference was recorded, so you can find the slide there. All right. So are there any questions so far? Yes. Could, could you say again? <clears throat> so you, you had here the example of the theta graph. Yeah. So what is if I take the other, another graph on three edges? So I take just the bubble on two edges and then a tap bone. Yeah. You get. They don't make me do the complex live. On the, <laughs> uh, I can do but, it afterwards, but it, there's but, no difference. But what determines this? This the pink stuff in in the cube. The pink so stuff in the cube off? is is. Uh, so the point is, uh, what kind of contractions are you allowed? So the pink stuff allows you to go to gamma mod f. So this is what the pink is. <laughs> Isn't there a game like this? Anyway. Okay, I, I see. You see? Yeah. So that's the, the pink stuff is you start out with the with the graphs, and but then the only morphisms you allow is contraction by f by subforce. And I'm glad you asked that question because this is a, these type these categories were first sort of I don't know if this is first probably this is wrong but I'll attribute them to user so these are user type categories so the actual proof is that you prove that in the left Khan extension you're supposed to take a co-limit over a comma category and then you prove that the comma category is equivalent to a user category. That's the heart of the proof, but you can always do that. So thank you. So that basically exactly means you start out with whatever graph you have, and then what you're allowed to do is edge contractions, but only you're not allowed to, to change the topology. So that's what the pink stuff is. And then you know you can also contract loops, and that basically is the blue stuff, maybe the stuff that you're not allowed to do, right? So you can you, and so anyway, if you add those in, it actually works out nicely. All right, so uh, other questions? So then, so this is kind of nice. So I already have two of these things, you know, with uh, genus marking, without genus marking. But personally, where I came from, and maybe this again, so 80s and 90s was moduli spaces and ribbon graphs. And so now the question is, can we, what can we do with ribbon graphs? And now I can see here I didn't use it much. I used trees going into graphs. The module came out for free. But what about written graphs or the generalizations? Or, you know, whatever. Um, so on trees, this is easy because we have trees and we have planar trees. So what is the point here? I have a vertex, and here I have a vertex with a cyclic order. On the length. And there's something nice about a tree. If I have a tree and a cyclic order on each of the legs, I can embed it in the plane. So that's why they're planar. Now, what is that though? So what I want to do is I claim this is a functor. Which goes from this category, and uh, I didn't say it. I just drew it. So the category here has objects which are aggregates. That is just just destroyed unions of corollas. So I just have to tell you, and it's supposed to be a noidal functor. A noidal structure is disjoint union. So I just have to tell you what this is. And this is a set valued operand uh, functor. This is the cyclic orders on S. And so now there is a there is a nice theory. So I can look at the element category here. So what does that look like? Well, a typical element is I take my corolla plus a cyclic order on this. And this is how it's usually defined. It's like it's uh, the elements are x and a, x and o of x. So if I have a functor, the the element category has uh, the object as the old category, and then one element in the functor. The value of the functor. So here it's just a star and an order. And so I can look at this element category here that actually has a name. So if I look at 
So it's uh, it's this element category. So this is as decorated by this cyclic gas. Those are the functors out of it are non sigma uh, cyclic operators. Then I set this page nicely. So actually, what happens here is upstairs here I'll have something which I'll call f surface, which is f modular. Well, I mean, I should decorate. I should decorate this guy with a functor from what? From here. I have a functor from here, namely the associated functor. I just wrote that. So how do I get it up? How to get it here? I just push it forward. So what I can do is. And so I get a diagram like this. This, uh, this is in a paper with um, um, Lucas, uh, Lucas of KL. Okay, I'll decorate the five category. So I can complete the diagram like this, and then I can do the same thing, but then it's actually kind of interesting. So what do I get out? So if I look at now <coughs> things up here, the objects are uh, surface modular graphs, which means that what is a decoration? So the decoration, the surface decoration is a little bit more than a ribbon graph decoration, but uh, it has, uh, how do I want to say that? I'm say is that it's a typical element of this F surf. Seeing something in here, what is it? It's going to be a vertex, but this S, first of all, there's going to be a genus. And there's another puncture. So this is a large S or the P is a number of punctures, number of internal punctures. And then there's S1. SB, where each SI has a cyclic order. Um, this is S. So it's a partition of S into a polycyclic set. So this is a polycyclic order of S. And the polycyclic order on S is the same thing as sigma as an automorphism of S. You just take the cycle decomposition. So if you want, it's a it's the object, two natural numbers, and an automorphism of S. That's what these things are indexed. And what is that supposed to be? Well, it's supposed to be a surface. So you have you know S1, S2 punctures on the on the boundaries, then you have some internal genus and some mark points too. So that's why we call it surface. And so these are you see that the ribbon graphs sit in here. And the funny thing is that again, it's a Feynman category. So you can compose all these things just like you could compose graphs. Never told you what the composition of graphs is. Also, no one asked. Composition of graphs is insertion of graphs into, sub, into graphs. So the decomposition is, is uh, taking subgraphs and co graphs out. I mean, you can make it how it is. So then, uh, what the theorem here says that uh, indeed you get what does the theorem say? Theorem says if you take W of the push forward of the cyclic dissociative, <coughs> downstairs actually that <coughs> it will look like this, and you evaluate that at some star Gn, then this is the cone over the Konsevich Penner compact combinatorial complexification, which contains this. KP, which contains this open part. So, and uh, this is, and that contains the spine of it. This is so, that's also the picture I drew. So, you can do this with 
with ribbon graphs as well as graphs. And if you were so inclined to do it with directed graphs or whatnot, you can do it for, as I said, for wheel things, for this, for that, for the other. The list of decorations is sort of sheer endless. And you can look in the paper with, um, with Jason Lucas. So if you have a different kind of operatic theory that you like, maybe proper ads or wheel proper ads or something like that, it just follows from just coverings. And yeah, and the association to graph complexes, I explain as well. Right, so now comes the fun part. So I sort of have a few comments and things that I found interesting and got to uh, figure out while talking to people here. And I mean, maybe let me start at the, so if there, I'm sorry, I should ask any questions because then I can go on to just general niceties or interesting things. So basically just short wrap up. So there's this, this theory of cubicle fiber categories. What that does is it allow, allows me to construct cubicle complexes. Uh, and then once I have that, I can look at the link. I get a compactified modular space, or I, I'll call that, I get the link. I call that compactified modular space. If I have a relative situation, namely I have some sort of, a factorization of morphisms and what's the factorization here if i do some edge contraction i can first contract uh the things that are allowed namely a tree and then sort of the things that are not allowed namely the loop and every contraction i can factor uniquely as first contracting a spanning tree and then some loops that's that's the that's the standard story and so then if, if all the the right things just, you know, just uh, spanning tree contractions form a subcategory, then everything is nice, but I have to be able to separate the two. And that's how you get the inclusion. Otherwise the inclusion doesn't work. <coughs> All right, so that is the story. And then you can ask several other questions, which is sort of nice. So let me ask some other questions. So this is fine. So then you can ask, you know, what about the, some questions and answers and partial answers. So the first question is what about the truncation? Like you saw in Ben's talk, truncation. And then there's a nice theorem with uh, Javier Zuniga well, for this uh, moderate modularized space case. There is a canonical go up um, M G N bar max, which flows down to M G N bar Kimura slash of Warnoff. So this is the one that they wrote down for string field theory. This has some new name. To the linear Mumford compactification to the Penner compactification. And what this uh, blow up does is <clears throat> here on these blue vertices, actually, what it does is it blows up all these in this thing, it will blow up these things. And you will see in this particular example, you will see a couple of hexagons. And uh, Javier just gave at the AMS conference, he just gave a nice talk about that with these pictures that should be also online. So this is the blow up, the blue thing is the blow up. So that's the, and you see that I, if I do this, I sort of get hexagons if I did it right. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that hexagon is a permutahedron. And so this is the full blow up, which is a permutahedral blow up. So that's nice. So that's what the blow up gives you. And then you can ask other questions. So there's some things which are sort of, which come from a, so I have 10 minutes and too many things to say. So what this blackboard is, which I didn't use is, there's something that combinatorists or, uh, well, who knows? Simplicial people, algebraic topologists will tell you, is that the path space on the simplex is a cube. So which means here I have a simplex, I have, if I go from zero to two, I can go zero, one, two, or zero, two, either two things. And this is actually pole set, so this is actually, at uh, this guy. So here, if I have a three simplex, I can go zero, one, two, three, that's the full way, but I could also just go zero, one, three, zero, two, three, or zero, three. And again, this is a post set with a clue. 
Now, if I do the same thing again, if I do the path space on a cube, actually I get a permit uh, You can see that here. If I want to go from this edge to that edge on the cube, there are exactly six ways of going. And we've seen that because uh, in Ben's talk, we said, you know, a cubicle finding category is quadratic. The whole point is that if I, how do I get to these six things? I switch on each face, which is a quadratic relation. So that's the content of the statement that a cubic refinement category is quadratic and I can take the caution of all. And so then I get this, but this has another nice interpretation, namely that what are these six factorial, uh, three factorial, which is six. Deep mathematics here. Uh, what does that also mean? This also means that uh, this cube disassembles into six factorial simplices, right? Uh, that, that's the usual thing. How do you disassemble a cube into simplices? And now there's the first thing that's kind of interesting is uh, there is these cubes, so there's naturally associated, uh, there are these variation matrices. So now, as I said, I, I can start having fun. So let's see which one do I have time for two times fun? Yes. So, first fun thing. So, fun fact number one. So I have these variational matrices. And uh, they actually come from a cube. And then I have n factorial of these, and these correspond to exactly the n factorial synthesis. Also the n factorial path. And now, but then there is a mystery, or here's an answer, which is kind of And maybe some of you knows here. So, but these matrices are of this form. They they look like this. Uh, so they have n times n minus one over two coefficients, which is n over two. I just learned that from Karen. No, but she reminded me that this is true. So, and then uh, what what are the so? But if I have a simplex, so if I have an n simplex, then I have many many subsimplices. So that can't be right. There are more supplement simplices here than these guys. So how do I get them? So this corresponds, this is one-to-one -one correspondence with subsimplices of this form, uh, which are this continuous interval sitting here. Um, or I think. And those are the ones that in the dual notation, so here's a mystery, which is kind of fun. So if I write this in a dual notation, I will see these guys. And so it's a funny, it's a funny coincidence, which I don't have a good uh, um, answer to yet. The fact is, I know uh, what, what to associate a matrix to. I know what the coefficients are. Those are exactly coming from the faces of this uh, uh, corresponding to these uh, to these sub things, which are intervals in here. And these correspond to two things. So they first in, in finite set or you know in delta. In the simplicial category, these are the inert morphisms. Um, in uh, Lurie and uh, Clemens Bagger sense, and in this Gontroff Brown picture, those are the ones that are the generators for the infinitesimal um, derivations. So I don't know. It's maybe just numerics, but I think maybe there is something deeper. So that's fun fact one. And then fun fact two, as I promised. So, there is a fun fact too, is that for cubes, Sarah wrote down for cubical chains, there's a co product. So, cubical chains, cubical, Q, B, co chains. Have a product. And so here the chains have a co product. So this is cell 51. And what's the co product? It's, it's basically given by the embedding of IN to IN across IN, where you send, uh, so what is this diagonal approximation? Uh, 
Uh, this is given by the sum over k sitting inside uh, zero, no, one up to n e zero k. So this would set those coordinates. So this means if it's in here, it gets set to zero. So this is n bar. So and then the complement, you take one. And now, so some some more fun facts. We've seen this. If I think of uh, D one as, then we've seen this. This is exactly this kind of. Uh, this is the sum that we had before. So where we look at uh, gamma, which is a subgraph tensor. So let's see. This is if I cut those, the gamma is over here. So the gamma is inside that, and the. Uh, I think about this as a, as a spanning subgraph has all the vertices, but not all the edges. So then if I cut some of the edges, this is exactly what I get here. And then this one actually contracts it. So it looks like this, uh, if I consider this as a subgraph. But I could also you know, consider it you know, just as, a, as, a, as pulling out the subgraph. So it's very, it's very similar to what Karen wrote. And then I have a claim, which is probably true. So uh, you can do this. So in general, this will be, you know, uh, the, this was the co-product in the, in the uh, in Karen's talk was I had the delta of mt and the maximal thing, which is um, um, uh, it's called n because it's the sum of mt k tensor k maximal, and this is exactly this type of thing. And then what this a b specifies is this interval specifies a face of the cube. And then the combinatorial thing that Karen had, uh, I did check this, is actually the is the restriction of this coproduct to that phase. So then, so what 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 I was claiming is there's something fun going on, namely I have these two coproducts. So there's also a sort of nice fact, <laughs> sort of a fun category. With you know, let's call proper degree function. There is a coproduct. There is a Conheimer pet coproduct on the morphisms. And this is exactly the Conheimer called coproduct. So, and remember, my cubes depended on the morphisms. So I have these two coproducts on the morphisms, one which is coming from the south diagonal and one which is coming from the Conkheima coproduct. And of course, they agree. Why do I know that? Because the thingy was a functor. Uh, and this coproduct is just deconcatenation coproduct. So that's all phi is just sum over phi 0 times of phi 1, uh, where uh, phi 0 uh, and then the so other way around phi. Well, after five zero is five. Well, depending on which way you write it, you get the opposite coproduct. So these exist. So of course they should be compatible because it's a functor. Functor says it's compatible with concatenation. So it's compatible with deconcatenation. It's also functorial in uh, because this is just cubical chain. So that one exists, and then it uh, restricts nicely to the sides. Again, follows from just general nonsense. So I haven't figured out if, if that is exactly the equation you get. But these things are by algebra, and the multiplication here is this joint union. Tensor product, so this is actually a by algebra. And so that, uh, I, I guess that those things actually are true. And I have still no idea why, but so then the question is, what would actually these variational matrices mean? I don't know how they fit into the, into the picture. So they exist. I can write them down. They correspond to these paths. These correspond to these open parts of the simplex. I mean, I could draw a picture. Maybe I should also draw a picture. So uh, what is going on here? If I just have a triangle, then I'm keeping this cell, this cell, and that cell, and this one I don't keep. So it's not, it's not all of the cells. And it's also not just the one. But, uh, and then you can see what, what, what is missed here. And uh, these are sort of, if I, if I take um, my simplices that uh, uh, give my, um, cover my cube, then uh, sort of the internal faces of these simplices is the, is, are the things that are omitted here. And I again, don't know what that means, but it's just a fact. All right, so I think I'm exactly on time. Yes, you are. <laughs> So
sort of a remark. Maybe I'll, can I have a small remark? I, I was just wanted to point out, so you had put the freezing with the cutting and the marking, that it was another way of thinking of yeah. freezing it as opposed to contraction. And I know that I had said the opposite yesterday, and I wanted to point out that the reason, to me, the freezing is like contraction, and that comes from the fact that we always work with these polynomials that have the variables that are not in the edge. So to me, an edge is a thing that could be cuttable. And then if it's not cuttable, you're forcing it to be in there. And once you've forced it to be there, then you know every tree is always going to use it. So it might as well have just been contracted. Oh, so I think it's okay. because we always take these the polynomial that's sort of dual to the obvious polynomial, and that's why our freezing lives on the other side. Right. Yeah, I use freezing in terms of these uh, cluster algebra transformations. Well, length, sort of sense. Right, uh, where it's sort of a frozen variable means you don't get to use it, and sort of you can unfreeze it and then use it by freezing other variables. And this is not just by analogy, but they're the an cluster type variables. Uh, cluster varieties which work with the ribbon graphs and and um, what am I doing? Whitehead moves. So I and, think this should be related in the sense that if the variables you take are the ones of the of the edges that are there, which is the edges that are not there, then what it means to not be able to take that variable is opposite. Right. That could. Yeah. I mean, you did one more thing which I didn't do. Maybe that is also related. Namely, you. Um, in this duality thing, you took a spanning tree and say the things that are not, and you did two more things. So <laughs> you, you did a lot of things. Uh, one thing is that uh, uh, Karen was working in the relative situation where you actually previously, what I was saying here, which is sort of uh, functorial nothingness, where you don't have to check very much. It's just saying that you know things are functorial and the cubic of chains are a functor. Um, what she was doing was looking at the relative situation, which I had before, like embedding trees into graphs, and then you're looking at graph, tuples of graphs and spanning trees, and then there might be something more going on with the multiplications. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing, I'm not quite sure about what that actually is, is about, but I mean, um, this is sort of, it, it has something to do with the factorization, right? You were writing down cycles. And so the, the way, if I have a spanning tree and I claim that the edges not in the spanning tree represent the cycles, what I'm secretly doing is I'm contracting it down to a rose graph. And then the edges I see are the cycles. So that's the fundamental group. And that's exactly the factorization I was talking about. You, you, have, a, you have a graph and you want to factorize it. The way you can do it is you, you figure out a spanning tree, you contract that, you get a rose and that gives you the, the pi one. So the, then those are the ones that sort of are exactly those blue points. Right, and then you were taking those, and so now I get confused which ones are marked and which ones aren't marked. Right, but we can I talk. Sometimes it's always backwards to what it should be. That's, right. that's just reality. <laughs> are there questions or remarks from Zoom? Hi, Ralph. Maybe I could ask um, is it the MGN bar max that you have on the Board yeah. on the upper left hand side there. Is right. it maybe I didn't catch this, but known what its homotopy type is, or did this come from a W construction? Uh, that comes from a temp. Uh, I would guess that the homotopy type is the one of MGN bar KSV. Okay. Is it could it possibly be related to replacing this sort of S1 that you have at all the um, at all the nodes with the bar construction, two-sided bar construction of, of S1. I'd have to think about that. Actually sounds sounds about right. I mean, basically what the fun thing is that if you start blowing down stuff, you at the, at the end uh, get up. So first you just blow down contractible stuff. That's what I'm saying. And then uh, then you hit these S1s. And then there's this blow downs of the S1s, which gets you to the Lee Mumford. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think. Right, but I think you're saying the same thing, but I don't. It sounds to me like you're saying the same thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so, I mean, in particular, that could be somehow related to the W construction of the original right. MG modular. Right. Yeah. And what I didn't say is um, this is, of course, all related to this, uh, to this co product here, where you can read off the nesting. So the nestings you had are visible in this co product. Actually, these are like fun fact three and four. Uh, actually, the fact that something is cubical, you can look at the uh, sort of the, the correct, we call it the Quillen, Quillen Takeuchi filtration, but who cares what you call it? Uh, you have a co product here, and then it's sort of corneal potent. 
And um, so that filtration is exhaustive and you can check what the highest degrees where the stuff doesn't vanish and those will be skew primitive elements and you'll have exactly n factorial terms. So you'll have exactly the nestings, the full nestings. And then if you iterate this co-product at every point, you'll see all the nestings that you have. Uh, and those are the blowups you're looking at. Sort of makes sense. But the, those that well, it's like like you once told me, it's it's one less time that I'll have to hear it before right. I understand it. <laughs> that was my that was my quote. That that quote goes back to Gunther Hara, so I should attribute it, attribute it to the person. Okay. Further questions or remarks? Then let's thank Ralph again. Thank you.